This video covers additional relational operators, relational algebra operators, although not extended operators or extensions to the rest of mathematics. In particular, these operators include assignment, which is roughly speaking equivalent to the with statement in SQL, uh, the various join operations, and set intersection and set division. What happens if we're missing any of these operators? Nothing happens. More precisely, it doesn't affect the expressive power of the language. These are simply very useful operators to have within the language. And in fact, within SQL, it is very, very common for joins to be used a lot, um, although not this one so much. Uh, people use it, but they probably shouldn't. Uh, joins are in fact far to be preferred over Cartesian product. Um, set intersection and set division are also extremely useful, although um, how much this is available in standard SQL will vary according to your database engine. Obviously, MySQL doesn't even include intersection, although the big databases, Oracle, DB2, certainly will. Okay, start with the assignment operator. This is simply a convenient way to express complex queries by providing for temporary variables. So if we think about the calculate the maximum salary operation, which we did a few slides ago back here, this was done ultimately as a single query. Let me clear out this so we can see what the query was. Okay. This was ultimately done as, let's pick blue, say, was ultimately done with this single query. And you can imagine things getting far more complex far more quickly. So it's very convenient to do things like, let's create a temporary variable that captures this. And in fact, a, a slightly smarter name for this wouldn't be temp. It would be something more like, um, uh, less than max sal, for example. Okay, so this is standard um, programming language advice, which is the appropriate thing to do is have meaningful variable names, and something like temp is obviously not a meaningful variable name. Okay, so defining things within relational algebra as distinct variables can help a lot. So if we call this less than max cell, then this is name and salary minus less than max cell. Okay. Um, the core operator equivalent, uh, there is no core relational algebra equivalent. What you do is you simply have to put the, the contents of whatever it is within the expression. The core SQL equivalent, as I said, is the with statement, uh, which was not available in my SQL version 5 point whatever the latest 5 point whatever was, but did come in in version 8 point, I think roughly 14, 8.0.14 or maybe 1.6, I can't remember, somewhere around there. If you want to know, the current version of MySQL is at 8.0.21, last I checked. It's somewhere around there. Um, I mentioned that because... There will be many websites and you could easily wind up in a company in which a website is not or a, or a company is not using even version 8 of MySQL. They'll be using older versions. OK, so while it's really nice to have, do beware that that might not be present. OK. Second, now let's get into joins and there are four well, 
joints are actually have orthogonal issues. But we'll start with what is referred to as the natural join operator. Suppose we have two relations, R and S. And those two relations each have schema, big R and big S. So let's say R is some relation, okay, has schema capital R, and it has A, B, C, D, okay? And let's say S has schema capital S with B, C, E, F. Okay, the attribute names that are in common are B and C. So a natural join will say, take the Cartesian product of R with S, okay, take their Cartesian product, but only use the rows where the column from B in R is equal to the column of B in S, and the column of C in R equals to the column of C in S. Okay, so that's what this says. And by way of example, this is, let's consider R as A, B, C, D, and E, B, D. So the common columns are B and D. The resulting schema would be A, B, C, D, E. By the way, in this case, the resulting schema would be A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay. So in this example, A, B, C, D, E. And the core operator equivalent, Cartesian product, select the columns from R, uh, select, sorry, not the columns, select the rows where column D in R equals column D in S, and where column B in R equals column B in S. And then project it out over the union of the two relational schemas. Okay, so example, here's R and S, the columns in common are B and D. So let's work these out. First of all, how big is R cross S? Okay, well, the cardinality of R is 5, there's 5 rows, the cardinality of S is 5, there's five rows in S, so the cardinality of R cross S will be 25. So I'm not going to spell all of those out, but this does perhaps give you an idea of why we prefer joins over Cartesian product and selection. Because when we do a join, we just are automatically throwing out a lot of extra material. So let's consider this. We'll start with row 1, and we match it up with row 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 of this. So the B matches the B. The D doesn't... Uh, sorry, the D matches the D. And so row 1 from S and row 1 from S. Did I say row 1 from S over here? Row 1 from R and row 1 from S is our first row. Now, let's take this. Uh, B is 1 and D is 1, and we'll match it up with this. Well, B is 3, so we're not going to match it. What about this one? B is 1, D is A, so we've got a match. So again, this is row uh, 1 from R, and row 3 from S. Okay. Continuing on to the fourth row of S. B is 2, doesn't match the B of 1 from R1. So that's not a match. And then row 5, B is 3, doesn't match the B of 1 here. So we're done with row 1 in R. Now let's look at row 2 in R. 
B is 2, so we can ignore. Um, we'll, we'll clean this up because we're effectively starting over again. We're looking at row 2 uh, from R, and we're matching it up here. B is 2. Doesn't match, doesn't match, doesn't match. This one potentially matches. D, however, is A here in R, and it's B here in S. So there is no row from, there's no row from R, no row 2 from R that's matching a row from S. So we can now move on to row 3 from R. Row 3 from R is this one. B is 4. There's no value of B here, so row 3 from R is also a dead letter. We can get rid of that one. What about row 4? B is 1. Okay, so we've got this as a possibility and this as a possibility. D is A. Yep, we've got a match and we've got a match. So, row 4. This one. Alpha 1, Gamma A, Alpha. Okay, that's this. Row 4 from R. S1. Row 1 from S, and Alpha 1, Gamma, A, Gamma, S3. So both of those are row 4. Now let's look at the final row, row 5 from R. Okay, B is 2. That's a 2 there. D is B. We've got a match. So... R5, row 5 from R, matches row 4 from S. And now we have the natural join. So that's good. Instead of winding up with 25 columns, because what we would do is Cartesian product first, R times S, will produce 25, uh, 25 rows, I mean, not 25 columns, will produce 25 rows, which we would then filter down to five rows. Instead, what we're doing is we do this join operation that automatically avoids the 25 rows, but produces just the rows we need as we go. Okay, what can we say about natural join? Well, Here's an example of an issue, and this looks like a good query. Find the names of all instructors in the computer science department together with the course titles of all the courses that the instructors teach. So there's the instructor table, which has an ID and a name and whatever else. This will have an ID and a course ID. And this course will have uh, a course ID. Okay. So we basically join instructor with teachers with course, select just the department name to computer science, and produce the name and the title. It's nice, it's very clean, very efficient. The natural join is associative, which means we can join the instructor with teachers and then join it with course. Or we can join teachers with course and then join the result with instructor. And this may not matter in a case like this, but in general matters for performance reasons, the query optimizer will figure out which one of these is fastest. You see, if this produces very few rows... Okay, and this produces very many rows. It may be more efficient to do this one first and then join it with the instructor rather than doing this one first and then join it with the courses. So natural join has the ability to do something nice. But let's consider this. Suppose we have a pet. Now, the vet operation has pets that it's keeping track of, and the owners, 
and of course it needs to map the owners to pets. So owners have IDs and names and addresses and pets have IDs and names and species. So you might have, oh, I don't know, pet number one, two, three, and his name is Fido and he's a dog. And we've got um, owner ID number ABC and his name is George and he lives in Waterloo whatever his address is and George owns Fido so somewhere in the owns table we've got something like one two three and ABC so that's all nice and good and we say okay we want to find the name and address of every dog owner so we do pet joins owns joins owner and select the dogs and give us the name and address what is wrong with this? Okay. Pet joins owns. Okay, so that will take pet ID and name and species. And it joins it with the owns, so we'll have the owner ID. But then we join it with the owner. Now the owner has an owner ID and a name, so it will match the owner ID and the name, which means instead of getting the name and address of every dog owner, this will give us the name and address of every dog owner whose name is the same as the dog that they own because it's going to want to match names, not just the owner ID with the owner ID. We're going to want to match the names, or at least that's what this query will do. So what does it actually compute? The names of dog owners who have the same name as their pet. Now, there's probably like two people on the planet who have the same name as their pet. I mean, you just wouldn't do that. So honestly, is this really a problem? Let's go back to this. We were looking at instructor teachers course. Now, I avoided something when I was talking about this. An instructor has a department and a course has a department you see for example um, the database course that you are currently taking is an ECE database course but it turns out that sometimes instructors are teaching courses that are not in their own department or they don't have the same designation for example, an ECE instructor might teach a software engineering course, or they might even teach a computer science course. For example, there are courses that are jointly listed between computer science, software engineering, and electrical and computer engineering. So you could easily have a faculty member teaching a course that is not in the same department as the faculty member. So what this query is in fact doing is not simply finding the names of instructors in the computer science department together with the courses, the course titles of the courses they teach, but is in fact finding the names of all instructors in the computer science department together with the course titles of all the courses that those instructors teach, provided that the course is a CS course. If the instructor is teaching, for example, the uh, fourth year and graduate testing course, that goes under the label SE 465 or something like that. It also goes under the label ECE 453. 
that would not be listed. And so to answer the question, is this really a problem? Yes, that is really a very, very big problem because while there might be only two people on the planet who have the same name as their pet, it is also the case that the vast majority of courses that instructors teach are within their own department. And therefore, when you did this previous query and you say, do these results look correct? The answer is the results will look correct. Because if you've got 98 or 99 percent of the answer there, it's very hard to look at it and say, I think something's missing. OK, so. What is the takeaway from this? The takeaway is natural joins are there. You will see them in the industry, but they're a really bad idea to use them. When you are writing your own code, you should avoid them. By the way, what I described is only one problem with natural joins. There is a second problem with them. Whoops, over here. Suppose I have a relation R, which has A, B, C, and D. And I have a relation S, which has attributes B, E, and F. And I have some code elsewhere that does a query, and in its query it does the cross product of S and R. And this is all very good, and it all works well, and it's all nicely tested, and everybody's happy with it. It passed all its testing. It's correctly joining on these two columns, and everything's fine. Now remember back DDL, the Data Description Language. One of the things you can do is you can change a table. You might change the table S. And in changing the table S, you might add another column. And for whatever reason, the column that you add is maybe column D. Which means the code that you had here that was working is now going to break. And it's going to break because... This is now part of table S, and so instead of just joining on column B, it's now joining on column B and column D. And you say, well, why on earth would you give it the same name? And the answer is because it depends what that name is. OK, certainly the case of you can have names for columns that would be unique. For example, you could have student ID within a student table, but you might just as easily have ID in the student table, and you might have ID in the instructor table, and you probably don't want those things to be joined because a student ID and a faculty ID are likely to not be the same thing. You probably do not want to join on that. You could have a column name and later you break it down into a first name and a last name. You could imagine things like that. So this type of thing where you add a new thing or you change things around is quite conceivable. OK, so avoid natural joins because you do not know what the columns are on which the join is taking place. So problem number one, small missing data is very hard to detect. And problem number two is that issue of change. But even more broadly, I need to look at the relational schema in order to know what the join is on. 
I don't know what the join is taking place on without looking at the actual schema. And if the schema changes, the join changes. So is there a better way? Okay, there is, and that is you specify what you're joining on. So we're going to start by describing what is called inner join. Inner join is a natural join, except instead of saying, instead of implying, rather, which columns are joined on, we specify the column. Specify which, whoops, which attributes, which attributes are used for the join. Okay. Now there are two ways in which this might occur. One is to simply say, we will specify the column names that are joined, okay? Assuming that there is an overlap between the two, okay? So we have join on PID, join on OID. These inner joins just nicely take place, okay? Join the pet table to the owns table using the pet ID, join the result of this using the owner ID to the owner, okay? More broadly, specify the columns, R of alpha equals S of alpha, R column beta equals S column beta, um, and R, R dot gamma equals S dot gamma, and however many. So this is how the inner join operates, okay? Now, if the columns have a different name, we can specify what the two different names are, okay? So we can say r dot alpha equals s dot beta, okay? Um, this, is, this is broadly how inner join works, and let me see if I can give a nice little example of it. Suppose I have relation a b c this is r and s is d e f then i can do r join b equals d um s okay so we will simply make sure that these two columns have to be equal. So this is equivalent to um, R cross product S and then select them where B equals D. Okay. Now, I said it's sort of like the natural join insofar as other than the fact that we're specifying the column, everything's the same. Both natural join and inner join, though, can be viewed as losing information. What do I mean by that? Well, when I say find the instructor that's teaching a particular course, I say, okay, join using the instructor ID between instructor and teachers, and then take that and join that with the course ID to the course. What's wrong with that? Well, any instructor who is not teaching any course will be missed. You see, suppose we have our instructor table, ID, name, etc. So one, two, three, Einstein, and four, five, six, Mozart, etc. And we have a teacher's table. And it says Einstein is teaching, oh, I don't know, um, course A, B, C. And Einstein is teaching course D, E, F. But Mozart isn't teaching any course. 
So there isn't a four, five, six, and nothing. Okay, we don't have that in here. If Mozart isn't teaching anything, then there is no entry. So when we join this table with this table, we wind up with the result of being one, two, three, and Einstein, and whatever else, and somewhere we'll have an ABC. And we'll have a one, two, three, whoops. We'll have a one, two, three, and Einstein, and whatever else from the instructor, and he's teaching course DEF. Okay, and whatever else we have, but we don't have Mozart. And then somewhere we have a course table that says there's the course ABC, which is general relativity. Okay, and maybe DEF is special relativity. Okay. And whatever other courses we have. Okay. And so when we join this, which was the join of the instructor and the teacher's table, when we join that with this, and then just pull out the instructor information or something like that, we're going to wind up with Einstein is teaching general relativity, and Einstein is teaching special relativity. But nowhere do we get a column that says Mozart is teaching nothing. This is lost. And let's say we also have a course GHI called, I don't know, Very Special Relativity, okay? Which sounds like a weird course, okay? And nobody's teaching it. So we don't have a column that says, okay, Very Special Relativity, and no one, okay? So both of these are missing, Okay. Now, it's not entirely fair to say they're missing because the join operation wasn't intended to capture them. But we would like to identify what are the courses that aren't being taught and who's teaching no courses. So let's start with the who's teaching no courses. We use what is called a left outer join. To find the instructors who are teaching no courses, what we do is we do a left outer join, and this says, if there's somebody in the instructor table, then we match them who's in the teacher's table on the ID column. We're going to match them up. But if there's an instructor ID in the instructor table, that simply doesn't exist. So for any instructor that is not teaching any course, there's no teacher's table. What we do is we fill in nulls. So when we join instructor and teachers with a left outer join, okay, we get Ein we get the one, two, three, Einstein, and he's teaching A, B, C. And we get one, two, three, Einstein, and he's teaching D, E, F. And we get four, five, six, Mozart, and null. Okay? Not teaching any course. So we managed to capture that. In this particular case, I've got Jones is not teaching any course. Okay. Now, why do we need two left outer joins? And the answer is because when we did the first left outer join, we got this. And so now we want to match that up to the course table. And so we look at the course ID and join it with the course table. So we're joining this with the course table using the course ID. And this will be the course ID. And so obviously we find an ABC match for it. So we've got the ABC, one, two, three, Einstein, etc. And it'll be general relativity or whatever it is. And then we'll get the one, two, three, Einstein and DEF because we can also find that course. But then when we come to the null, 
Null is null. It, it, it's no course ID. So there's no course associated with that. So in order to capture that row, we again have to use another left outer join. Could we avoid that? Yes, we could. The way we would avoid that is the reason this is happening is because... The operations are taking place left to right. This join is happening and then disjoin. If instead we put some parentheses around this, whoops, around this, so that we force this join to take place first, that will give us the correct match, okay? That should work out. Now, right out to join. How do we capture the missing courses that we need? We want to capture. Well, we do a right out to join. Now, this one, we're not missing instructors. So we can just use the regular join for the teachers. Okay. The regular join will find all of the instructors. Okay, so we will get four, five, six, and Mozart. He'll be gone because we don't care about it. We're just finding the missing stuff. So here we have the courses. We've got A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay, and nobody's teaching the G, H, I course. Nobody's teaching very special relativity. So that'll be listed here. It won't be listed here. So we want the right outer join when we join these two together. But that's fine. We don't have to do that first. We can simply join these two first because the join takes place left to right. So we join in a join instructor and teachers. So it won't capture the Mozart, which is fine. We wind up with Einstein teaching ABC. We have Weinstein teaching DEF. We have no Mozart with a null here, which is fine. But then we do the right outer join, and we've got the ABC, we've got the DEF, we've got the GHI, and this one has no match in the join of the teachers and instructors table, so this one winds up getting the null associated with all of this. So when we do that level of operation, we get Einstein teaching special, Einstein teaching general, and nobody teaching very special. So simply put, when we have the right outer join, it all works without the additional right outer join because implicitly that one is done first. Whereas in this case, because this is done first, that's why we needed the second left outer join. And if you wanted to avoid the second left outer join, you need to make sure that the left outer join does that first. And then you can do a simple inner join for the second one. Okay. What if we want both? Use a full outer join, which means do the left and the right, and it will capture both of them. Okay. My SQL does not include the full outer join. It does have the left outer join. It does have the right outer join. It doesn't have both. That's fine. Use the union operator in order to capture the full outer join. Okay. One final type of join, the theta join. Okay, theta here, this looks like a column name. It isn't a column name. This is a predicate or an expression. Okay. Which is basically saying, I don't just want equality between columns. I want to do something else. So here's an example. Let us join... Um, instead of having a selection operation here, we've eliminated the selection operation. We've simply said join pet to owns using pet ID. Oh, and also specify species equal to dog. Okay. 
because the whole thing becomes a predicate and then join it here. So this is just the standard inner join, but this is a theta join, okay? Now, technically, an inner join with different column names is a theta join, okay? But basically, that's fine, okay? Theta joins can be inner or outer, Okay, you can do a left inner, a right inner, or a uh, sorry, a left outer, a right outer, or a full outer, or an inner theta join. The inner versus outerness has to do with whether or not you match for missing data, whereas the theta aspect is do I do a general predicate or do I do equality between columns? The one comment I would make is I personally am not a huge fan of this. Um, I don't mind equality between columns, but as soon as I start doing other stuff in a join, it tends to be it, it tends to read slightly strangely to me. However, that may just be me. Okay, I don't want to, to say that you have to have a selection predicate. It is, however, strictly speaking true that if you have a theta join, you could eliminate a lot of the use of the selection predicate. Okay, final two operators uh, to do with sets. So we're done with joins and we're now looking at sets. Set intersection. Well, we know what set intersection is. It means the columns have to be in... The, the, the rows have to be in both relations. So the tuple such that the tuple is in R and the tuple is in S. Obviously, same arity and compatible. Why do we not need it? Because in terms of core operator equivalence, and this is weird, it takes a while to wrap your brain around. When most people see R minus R minus S, they tend to think, oh, well, that equals S. And it doesn't, and it's to do with how set subtraction is working. This eliminates from R anything that is in S. It doesn't eliminate from R anything that is uh, not in S. And it doesn't matter if there's something in S that is not in R. So this has eliminated from R anything that's not in S, which means what's left is the things, things in R that are not in S, which means they're not in the intersection therefore not in R intersection S. So if we take away the things in R that are not in the intersection from the things that are in R, we're left with the things that are in the intersection. Okay? Again, we don't have intersection in the relational algebra, uh, sorry, in MySQL, and so, again, in MySQL, you can use subqueries to provide this. If you have more money and can afford something like DB2 or Oracle, you can uh, get intersection and set subtraction. And so, by way of example, alpha 1, not in both, beta 1, not in both, beta 3, not in both. That, however, is in both. Now, finally, and this one is tricky to deal with. If you remember in subqueries, we had the who are the students who take every course in biology? Well, I'm going to show you an operator in relational algebra that makes that query easy. And it's very useful for things like sales analysis examples. So first, let's define it. Set division. If I want set R divided by set S, first of all, they have to be compatible. So the schema for S 
has to be a strict subset of the schema for R. So let's say the schema for R um, is R, A, B, C, D. If the schema for S is capital S and B, C, E, then R divided, whoops, R divided by S doesn't exist. Okay, let's get rid of that E. Now we're okay. R divided by S exists. R divided by S is going to have whatever name you want to give it, but it will have the attributes, the columns, A and D. Okay, that's point number one. Point number two, how is it defined? It's defined as the cross product. Okay, let's call the R divided by S equal to T. Okay. So it's the largest relation such that T times S is a subset of R. So in this particular case, we've got AD is our T relation cross S, which is a BC relation. That's why we get the ABCD. Okay, that's how you get back to this thing. Okay, now it's the largest relation that is a subset of it. It is akin to integer division. If I think about 11 divided by 3, how is that defined as? It's defined as the largest integer such that I can multiply it by 3 and it'll be less than 11. So the result of this is 3. Okay, 3 times 3 is 9. If it was 4, 4 times 3 is 12. It's too big. Okay. So, how can we use this? Suppose I say this relation ID and course ID, okay, is just the projection of courses from the takes relation. This S of course ID is the projection of courses from the course relation where the department is biology. So this is every um, offering of a course uh, or every course ID um, in the biology department. So bio 101 and bio 102 and whatever. Every single biology course, okay? This is every student ID and every course they have taken. So student Fred, student ID 123 has taken Bio 101. And 123 has taken Bio 102. And 456 has taken Anthropology 695 and whatever. Okay, so this is just the biology courses and this is just the student IDs and the courses they've taken. I divide this relation R by S. This is all of the students who have taken every course in biology. And it's every course in biology because I defined it that way. Okay, I could take a different description here. I could take every first year biology course or every first year course in arts. Okay, if I want to think about it in terms of products, who has, let's say I'm a bank, how many, how many of our customers are using every one of our products? We have savings accounts and checking accounts and mutual funds and RRSPs and RESPs, etc. 
I want to identify the people who are using all of our products. Actually, I don't. What I really want to do is identify the people who are not who are using some of our products, but not all of our products. So the way I do that is identify the people who are using all of our products and take that away from, do set subtraction from the set of all of our customers. And that will identify all of our customers who are using some of our products, but not all of our products. Because then I've got a potential market, okay? You've got a saving account with us and a checking account and you've got a credit card, but you don't have a, um, a, a mortgage with us, okay? So set division is incredibly valuable at being able to really quickly expressively describe groups of people who satisfy certain criteria okay and if you want to think about why the sql was so awful for that it is inherently awful because in terms of the core operator equivalents it is this horrible mess okay I take the projection of R over R minus S, take the Cartesian product of that with S, subtract R, take the projection of that of R minus S, and take that whole thing away from the projection of R minus S of R. Ugh. You translate that to SQL, and you will get the query that we did earlier in the subquery section for not exists. OK, if you want to see how the example plays out, this is a very simplified version. Course is a bio 101, 301 and CS 101. The student ID is one, two, three and four. So student one is taking bio 101 and bio 301. Student two is taking CS 301. Then we've got the set bio 101 and bio 301 is the set of all courses in biology r divided by s is one and you're able to show this because if you do this as the individual projection items that's projection of r minus s of r then this is the cross product of that with s okay this is the cross product of that with s minus r and this is the projection of that. This is temp2. I'm going to call this temp2. This is temp2 minus um, uh, doing the projection to R minus S. And then this is the subtraction of the product. I don't bother going through this in more detail than that because it's best for you to work it out for yourself. But if you begin to understand this, you will realize that this is a very powerful operator for doing analysis of who is part of a particular group based on whatever your definition of the group is. Students who have taken all courses in biology. Customers who have all of the following products, etc., OK, and that concludes the lecture on the additional operators for the relational algebra. I will have a brief additional lecture that covers the group aggregation operator and the application of additional mathematical functions and mathematical operators and set operators with the relational algebra as a separate lecture and slides.